Okay, myths and reconsiderations is perhaps a bit of a um, over pompous title. Uh, secondly, um, this is going to be, uh, we, we put down on the uh, website for reading a series that I wrote uh, a few years ago uh, on the revolution, but this is going to be slightly at a tangent to that. The reason why it's going to be slightly at a tangent is because the series I wrote was addressed to uh, Trotsky's comrades who argue that uh, the theory of permanent revolution is fundamental to uh, modern uh, working class political strategy today. My understanding actually is that the theory of permanent revolution is addressed to what are the tasks of the working class um, in a country where capitalism has not yet come into existence, or not exactly where capitalism has not yet come into existence, but where uh, we do not have uh, a capitalist state regime as yet, A, and B, we have extensive pre-capitalist social relations of production, particularly in the countryside. And if we uh, uh, ask then to what countries, assuming that theory of permanent revolution is correct, which I think is probably false, uh, uh, assuming that the theory of permanent revolution is correct, to what countries is permanent revolution relevant in the 21st century? Well, perhaps Afghanistan. That's just about it. Almost everywhere in the world, uh, we have uh, capitalist, unambiguously capitalist state regimes. Now, they may be dependent capitalist state regimes, as in a large part of the world, dependent on other capitalist states, or they may be imperialist state regimes, a uh, much smaller class of, uh, 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 of states, but they are nonetheless capitalist state regimes. And secondly, in relation to uh, social relations of production, that is, the means by which the surplus is extracted, uh, pretty much everywhere in the world, uh, the dominant social relations of production are capitalist social relations of production, and that is just as much true in reality of Indian agriculture uh, as it is of American agriculture. The ag agricultural forms are different, the modes of uh, exploitation are different, but it is not the case that there are large numbers of societies which are dominated by pre-capitalist landlord classes, pre-capitalist clerises, uh, slavery, villainage, um, <coughs> and uh, 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 other pre-capitalist social relations of production. So in a certain sense, uh, this, uh, the theory of permanent revolution is a historical problem. But it's a historical problem which is indirectly connected to uh, questions of present day strategy. And the, part of the reason why it's indirectly connected to questions of present-day strategy is that, uh, paradoxical as it may seem, although the theory of permanent revolution, as Trotsky and his allies argued for it uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, was directed against class collaborationism, against the class collaborationist policy of the uh, Communist Party of China and the Comintern towards the Kuomintang, in reality, the theory of permanent revolution has become, for most 21st century Trotskyists, a reason for class collaborationism towards uh, uh, lending political support to Ahmadinejad or uh, uh, to uh, this or that or the other left, national, <coughs> left bourgeois nationalist of, of one sort and another. Okay, so back to the theoretical issue, the theoretical problem. Uh, the original basis of uh, uh, the theory of permanent revolution is uh, the 1850 address of the Central Committee of the Communist League uh, to the League. Uh, and this is where the tag is first used in its modern sense. This book, which is an interesting read, Dan Guido, uh, Witnesses to Permanent Revolution. Um, Dan Guido, in their introduction, make a link with Marx and Engels writings in the 1840s on the French Revolution of 1789. And this link starts with uh, the Tennis Court Decree by which the National Assembly, when the Crown tried to dissolve it, asserted that it was in permanent session and could not be dissolved without its own consent. 
uh, an act uh, itself in reality copied from uh, the Long Parliament uh, in England in 1640. And thence uh, we find uh, Marx and Engels referring to the Jacobin period of the French Revolution as representing the permanence of the revolution, the insistence and the permanence of the revolution in this sense insists simply on we are not going to go back to the old regime. We will do whatever it takes, including cutting the heads off large num the king and large numbers of aristocrats, <coughs> instituting a regime of terror uh, uh, in order to prevent uh, a return to the old regime. The uh, 1850 address represents something slightly different. At the outbreak of the revolution of 1848, uh, the line of the Communist Manifesto uh, and of Marx and Engels uh, was that the proletariat as a class in the struggle against feudal absolutism had common interests with uh, the democracy, which was an ambiguous word which meant at this time democracy meant the democratic bourgeoisie, the section of the bourgeoisie which was liberal in its politics and uh, the section of the petty bourgeoisie which was liberal in its politics, was democratic in its politics. It goes a little bit further than uh, liberalism because uh, the democracy was more closely connected with uh, Jeffersonian democracy and uh, um, democratic interpretations of the French Revolution than with classical uh, balance of powers, Montesquieu, separation of powers, liberalism, <coughs> rule of law liberalism. But nonetheless, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, this uh, line of argument had, ran, had a common interest in the overthrow of the aristocracy, in the overthrow of uh, the absolutist state, which rested on feudalism. And that uh, belief that there was a common interest uh, was reflected in the project which Marx and Engels entered into on the outbreak of the revolution of 1848. The Neue Rheinische Zeitung, uh, New Rhineland newspaper, characterized itself as a paper of the democracy. In the course of the revolution, however, it became clear that uh, the bourgeoisie proper and the liberals uh, were not prepared to go to extremes uh, or to mobilize the masses on large scale in order to defeat uh, absolutism. On the contrary, they offered uh, constitutional accommodations, they made timid proposals, they allowed their organizations, uh, in spite of having said that they wouldn't, they allowed the representative bodies to be dissolved. They drew back from uh, any sort of radicalism. They certainly didn't intend to uh, reproduce uh, 1789 to 93, and, uh, or indeed uh, to reproduce uh, 1640 to 49. <clears throat> and in this situation, in the course of 1849-50, the Communist League, Marx and Engels included, shifted onto a different perspective, and this perspective uh, was in essence that uh, because the bourgeoisie had shown that it was too timid to make the revolution, it was going to have to be the case that even if the revolution started as the democratic revolution, the working class had to organize itself independently to push the revolution as far forward as it could possibly go. And from this, uh, we get the, uh, in the address of 1848, to make the revolution, quote, to make the revolution permanent until all the more or less propertied classes have been driven from their ruling positions, until the proletariat has conquered state power. And, uh, I'm quoting from Dan Guido, the ellipses has progressed sufficiently far, not only in one country, but in all the <coughs> leading countries of the world, that competition between the proletariats of these countries ceases, and at least the decisive forces of production are concentrated in the hands of the workers. So, permanent revolution here means continuous revolution, 
uninterrupted revolution, revolution going on and on and on until the point at which it reaches uh, not just the seizure of power by the proletariat in a single country, but uh, the socialization of the major forces of production on an international scale. In practice, this means a European scale. That's the terms in which they were talking at this time. Uh, European-wide revolution and uh, <clears throat> the beginning of communism. Now, this text was republished by Engels in the 1880s, but it was actually relatively marginal to the policy of Marx and Engels uh, in relation to the First International in their political correspondence after the First International, and especially with the German movement and the uh, uh, proto, what became the SPD. It resurfaced in the 1900s, and Dan Guido have done us a considerable service in publishing in English a lot of the texts uh, of this resurfacing uh, in the 1900s. In the first place, actually, from Riazanov, uh, non-faction social democrat, uh, in 1903, in a critique of Lenin's text, What is to be Done? Um, more famously adopted by Parvis and Trotsky, uh, in 1905, um, and a quote from the Parvis text, again from Dan Guido, a Russian provisional government will be a government of workers' democracy. At this point, the question of permanent revolution and the debate which is occurring at that time, and Dan Guido aren't at all good at this, this dealing with this, is actually a debate about strategy in relation to the peasantry working class strategy in relation to the role of the peasantry, which was the overwhelming majority of Russian society in the coming Russian Revolution. In order to <coughs> grasp this, we need to take a little bit of a step back. Why is it that uh, the 1850 address was marginal in uh, Marx and Engels' uh, subsequent arguments? In fact, we can start relatively early uh, with, uh, I think it's from the Cologne Communist Trial, it's a text from Marx Engels Collective Works 10. We're devoted to a party which most fortunately for it cannot come to power. If the proletariat were to come to power, the measures it would introduce would be petty bourgeois and not directly proletarian. Our party can only come to power when the conditions allow it to put its own view into practice. Louis Blanc, who was a French socialist who entered the uh, revolutionary government in uh, 1848 and became, as it were, the left face of a bourgeois government which in turn went and crushed the workers' movement in Paris. Louis Blanc is the best instance of what happens when you come to power prematurely. Why do, why, why do they say this? Okay. <coughs> Go a step further in relation to issues in relation to the peasantry. We're concerned with petty bourgeois. We're concerned with uh, what happens if the workers' party comes to power in a society which is actually dominated by the petty bourgeoisie. We've got a series of subsequent uh, quotations in relation to the agrarian question. Now, in relation to the agrarian question and the land, the line of the Communist Manifesto in 1848 is nationalisation of the land. Now, that's a policy which makes perfect, straightforward sense in the English agrarian regime as it existed at that time and the agrarian regime which existed at that time in the Netherlands, in the Veneto, in a few other small parts of Europe. That is a regime in which capitalism is carried on, on an, uh, agriculture is carried on on a capitalist basis with the farmer employing free labour but there is a superstructure on top of this capitalist basis of uh, rentier that is to say that the farmer, the capitalist farmer, rents the land, holds leasehold of the land which he uses uh, for agriculture. And in reality, that regime still exists actually in the way <coughs> capitalist industry in this country, characteristically uh, uh, what the uh, 
the capitalist owns on the relation to the land is a leasehold. And what nationalisation of the land, which was a slogan which uh, Marx and Engels bought, took from the Chartists, mm -hmm. what nationalisation of the land means in that context is nationalisation of the freehold interest in the land, the landlord's interest, which forms the superstructure, it's actually a financial superstructure in reality, uh, on top of capitalist production. In relation to uh, Western Europe, mm -hmm. you had uh, large peasant classes. This is Germany, Rhineland, Germany, France, uh, Italy, most of Italy. You had large peasant classes, but these peasant classes uh, were not producing as part of a feudal superstructure, but market-directed peasant production in fairly rapid transition in the direction of capitalism. In that, uh, in that area, there's uh, extensive discussion, uh, most clearly in uh, Engels' text in the, of the 1890s, the peasant question in France and Germany. And the line which is posed in the peasant question in France and Germany is this. The proletariat will not expropriate the peasantry. The proletariat in power will not engage in forced collectivization. What the proletariat in power will say to the peasant is you can survive, you will survive better if you enter into cooperatives, if you join in cooperative production. But we won't take your land off you. We can't make, there are certain promises we can't make in relation to you. We can promise in relation to you that uh, 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 we will perhaps control excessive usury by the banks, excessive uh, red taking by uh, landlords, uh, <coughs> and certain sorts of fraud. But we can't promise that you won't go bankrupt. We won't protect you from going bankrupt, and we won't, uh, the, the most we'll do uh, is very limited subsidies. We can't promise that we won't uh, apply minimum wage laws to your employees. We can't promise to prevent your employees from unionising themselves uh, in order to fight for better terms and conditions. We can't promise that your wives will continue to work for you, that your children will continue to work for you uh, when they see better jobs on offer in the factories, in business, etc. So we make very limited, a very limited promise to the uh, individual property-owning peasantry. We say, we aren't going to expropriate you. But we expect, in reality, that uh, uh, <coughs> competition will lead to your becoming bankrupt. East of the Elm, and in other countries where there is still um, uh, uh, pre-capitalist landlordism, We find from Marx and Engels a completely a third line, a completely different <coughs> line. Engels in 18, this is 1848, so it's contemporaneous. The big agricultural lands between the Baltic and the Black Sea can create, can escape from patriarchal feudal barbarism only through an agricultural revolution which transforms the enserved or corvée burdened peasants into free landowners a revolution which is altogether the same as the French Revolution in the countryside. Marx in 1851 on Italy, what is needed is complete emancipation of the peasants and the transformation of their sharecropping system. Sharecropping is a kind of rent relationship in which the peasant pays a share of the crop to the landowner rather than paying a money rent. The transformation of their sharecropping system <coughs> into free bourgeois property. Engels on Ireland, much later, 1888, a purely socialist movement <coughs> should not be expected from Ireland for some time. The people first want to become small landowning peasants. And when they do, the mortgages will come along and ruin them once again. In the meantime, there is no reason why we should not help them to liberate themselves from the landlords, that is to change over from a semi-feudal to a capitalistic position. 
So, the, <coughs> as I said, the, the 1848 Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels are saying the proletariat and the bourgeoisie have a common interest in overthrowing feudalism. In 1850, the uh, address of the, of the Central Committee of the Communist League, the 1850 address, says that the proletariat has to push the revolution forward in a direction which is in the direction of world revolution and socialism. But in response to the, uh, Cologne, in the, response to the Cologne trial and in uh, these writings on uh, the agrarian question, we find uh, what has been come to be called the stages theory. Mm -hmm. It's first necessary to have the bourgeois revolution, complete the bourgeois revolution, mm -hmm. before the question of uh, working class power and socialism uh, <coughs> can be on the agenda. Why do we have this movement? Mm -hmm. The answer is actually in absolute fundamentals, really basic, is the difference between Marxism and utopian socialism. The basic point is this, communism is desirable, it's desirable because it fits with the fundamentals of human nature as it evolved in the very long period in which we, are, we were hunter-gatherers. Forms of social inequality, in which one person permanently has the right to tell other people what to do, in which one group permanently has an uh, exceptionally large uh, share of surplus, are contrary to human nature. And this fact that they're contrary to human nature is reflected throughout history in the emergence of utopian forms of communism. Uh, it's there in early Christianity, it's there in uh, Pelagian writers of the 5th, uh, 4th, uh, 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 fifth, century AD, it's there in the uh, Mazdakites in, the, uh, uh, in Iran at the same period, uh, everywhere in the world, it's there through, uh, episodically resurfacing through the Middle Ages in the early modern period. Utopian socialism is the reflection of the fact that class society is in contradiction with the fundamentals of human nature. But, but, actually, in pre-capitalist society, communism is impossible. Post-hunter-gatherer, pre-capitalist society, communism is impossible. <clears throat> the reason why is that the, is, is twofold. The first is the labour burden, the productivity of labour under early agriculture through into feudalism, through into early capitalism itself. The productivity of labour is insufficiently high to support uh, the education of everybody in the world, everybody involved in uh, decision making techniques and in the productive techniques which are needed uh, to keep uh, uh, production going on. The society will only support a small leisure class, a small decision-making class, and therefore however much you attempt to cre recreate communism, a new elite resurfaces, a new class uh, elite, or more usually actually the reconstruction of an old class elite resurfaces uh, within, the, uh, 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 within the communist project. The second uh, is uh, precisely related to this question of the peasantry and petty production. The system of private property, <coughs> of petty family production, <coughs> looks egalitarian, but it's actually only egalitarian between the patriarchs. It's <coughs> the father of the family exploits, extracts surplus from the labor of his wife and children, even if he doesn't employ apprentices 
casual labourers, as in, in fact all peasants, all artisans, uh, all master craftsmen always do. He exploits the labour of his wife and children. And that production of surplus through his control of the labour of his wife and children enables him on a small scale to accumulate. That exploitation is tolerable for the wife and children as not being, it's not straightforward like class exploitation. But the reason why it's tolerable is because their position of being, having their labour exploited is a life cycle position. That's not quite true of uh, the women, but it's certainly true of the children. There, there is an expectation of inheriting the parental position as an item of private property. That expectation of inheriting the uh, parental position actually drives probably in, in pre-modern times 60 to 70 percent of all lawsuits are directly or indirectly inheritance disputes. Are fairy tales about the wicked stepmother mm -hmm. are about the conflict between the children of the first marriage and the children of the second marriage. <coughs> so the structure of this, relate, this system of petty family production contains internal contradictions and these internal contradictions are resolved to the extent that they are resolved by clinging to the petty individual property as lineage property, as property which descends through the family. Communism is impossible under petty family production, not just because <coughs> petty family production is insufficiently productive to enable everybody to be uh, educated in the skills of decision making, but also because the internal contradictions, mm, the antagonistic contradictions of the patriarchal family in petty family production express themselves as contradictions between uh, patriarchal families in petty family production. <coughs> In addition, these, the, there is another side to it. Every uh, system of petty family production also involves holdings in common. The Russian mir is the most famous, that you have a holding in common of the whole village, and periodically the land is redistributed among the villagers. Western uh, equivalents generally don't involve the, system, uh, the same system of uh, redistribution except where uh, the feudal landlords were able to impose it when... If the feudal landlords, in, in essence, the mere system, the, feud, the feud is one which the feudal landlords imposed. They imposed because it's in, in the interests of the feudal landlords to prevent some peasants going, growing rich and other peasants becoming so poor that they have nothing to live on. <coughs> Elsewhere, however, the commons exist as a necessary resource of the peasantry. But the commons are held in common only among the peasants who are commoners, which is not necessarily the same thing as the inhabitants of the village. The same is true of the artisan class in a different way. The guild is a commons of the artisan class, which is held in common by the artisans of that town. <coughs> and they fight about stopping incomers. Nobody who hasn't served their apprenticeship time in Exeter may become a tailor in Exeter. Um, <coughs> and similar measures in London, in uh, uh, um, York, and so on and so forth. So petty production, the petty production cannot form the basis of communism because of its internal antagonisms in the form of the patriarchal family which express themselves as antagonisms among the private property owners. But those antagonisms among the private property owners also express themselves as antagonisms between groups of commoners. 
again, a large amount of uh, English medieval <coughs> litigation uh, which, of, of a particular sort, which expresses, calls itself trespass with force and arms. Uh, or in Star Chamber is called riot. Uh, <coughs> is about disputes between one village and another about what commons. Mm -hmm. Another class of trespass with force and arms litigation. Can the mayor distrain my goods? That is, seize my goods. Am I subject to the jurisdiction of the guild? I was wrongfully arrested, but it turns out when we look at this wrongful arrest, that it's actually a dispute between two guilds about who has uh, uh, the monopoly of uh, the production of shoelaces. So, although petty production looks egalitarian and can support egalitarian ideologies, it cannot in fact support real equality, it cannot in fact support communism, collective appropriation of the forces of production. Capitalism, in contrast, makes it possible, makes communism possible. Capitalism makes communism possible <coughs> for two reasons, the first of which is it drives the petty bourgeoisie out of business and socialises the forces of production. Because capitalism tends to destroy petty family production, because capitalism tends to drive the peasantry off the land, because capitalism tends to drive the artisans out of business, and all these things which David <coughs> Harvey calls accumulation by dispossession. Mm -hmm. By doing this, capitalism is making communism possible. It creates a condition under which most people work for wages, work for a living, um, as part of collectively, common collectively organised tasks, and it becomes transparent that the claim of the capitalists to surplus is not really about private property, but it's really about the people who are the decision makers, the fat cats, lampooned in uh, the cartoons of the papers, yeah, ripping off like shop managers ripping off the collective till. The second, of course, is the fact that capitalism revolutionises the forces of production. And the consequence of the fact that capitalism revolutionises the forces of production is that it becomes uh, perfectly possible to conceive of everybody in the world uh, <coughs> spending uh, uh, a couple of months as a senior manager and then going back to the shop floor. Engels in The Anti-During gives the example. Uh, in socialism, it will make perfect sense for the consultant surgeon doing consultant surgeon work one week to be doing hospital porter work the next week. The porter doing the surgeon. Uh, the porter doing the surgeon's work. Mm -hmm. That's what, because the flip side of it. You know, that's, that is, a, that, it's that sort of image of society, which is at the end of the day what uh, <coughs> Marxist communism means. And um, what goes along with this, and this is why this conception that capitalism makes communism possible is fundamental to Marxism, is that it is only the working class, it is only the wage workers who potentially have the a uh, strategic interest in a communist transition. It is not the case that the peasants and the artisans and the intelligentsia you know, have a strategic interest in a transition to communism. The wage workers have a strategic interest in transition to communism because they're placed in the condition under capitalism of being forced to cooperate in uh, an extended, uh, uh, socially, uh, extended socially organised production uh, because they're forced under capitalism to cooperate in trade unions, in cooperatives, in collectivist political parties in order to defend their immediate interests. So this is the basic difference between uh, Marxian, social, Marxian communism and utopian socialism. That utopian socialism believes that socialism 
is simply, at the end of the day, an ethical imperative, which it's true, it is an ethical imperative, it's not that it's not an ethical imperative, but it's an ethical imperative which can be formed equally on the basis of peasant production, equally on the basis of artisan production, equally on the basis of uh, a purified capitalism, a capitalism without... Um, uh, uh, bankers, whatever it may be, perhaps a capitalism without Jews, as the German Nationalist, National Socialist German Workers' Party proposed. Yeah. Um, whereas Marxism insists that cap communism can only take place on the basis of capitalism, and on the basis of capitalism, uh, 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 on the basis of the working class. OK, we come back to uh, the permanent revolution and Russia in this context. Why is there this debate? It's not the question. Here is, there was 1850 address. The working class has to push the revolution forward until it becomes the world international revolution and uh, um, the uh, working class takes power and we get socialization of society. That goes out of practice after 1848 to 50 in terms of Marx and Engels' usage. They talk simply about advancing the position of the proletariat. In that context, they're perfectly willing to talk about we support capitalist revolution in the sense of the peasants becoming small capitalists in those countries where the peasants are not already small capitalists but are villains and serfs. The reason why that is the case is connected to the roots of Marxism as a diff distinct political tendency, one which stands for the road to socialism being through capitalism and through the dictatorship of the proletariat. In Russia, of course, in the early 1900s, what we find is uh, the repetition on a very much larger scale of uh, the events of the German Revolution in 1848. I, the bourgeoisie doesn't want to seize power. The bourgeoisie doesn't want to overthrow the regime. In a sense, that's totally and utterly unsurprising. If we look at who led the Dutch Revolution in the uh, 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 1570s to 1580s, it, was section, it wasn't, wasn't the big merchants, it was section of petty bourgeoisie. If we look at who led the English Revolution in the 1640s, it wasn't the big merchants who were by and large actually you know, the large capitalists who were by and large comfortably engaged in quasi-monopoly relationships with the Stuart state regime. It was a section of the petty bourgeoisie, a section of the intelligentsia mixed with the urban artisan class uh, uh, and small farmers. Mm -hmm. If we look at the French Revolution for that matter, <coughs> it was not big capital which led the French Revolution. But in Russia, we have this situation where we have uh, a highly concentrated urban proletariat developing the most radical urban pro proletarian politics on the basis of what was then the most advanced form of proletarian politics, the German Social Democratic Party, the influence of the German Social Democratic Party on uh, uh, the Russian movement. And when the revolution broke out in 1905, it was transparent to everybody that at least a large part of the driving force of that revolution was worker movements. It was not the case that the jackeree in the countryside led to the crisis of 1905. The defeat of the Russian regime in its war with Japan led to the crisis of 1905. Urban worker movements, which had been growing in strength since around 1900, precipitated that crisis into an open political crisis. The bourgeois liberals attempted to find a compromise solution, and the workers' movement radically pushed forward. And only quite late uh, on uh, in the year 1905 did the revolution spread into the countryside, and you begin to see uh, a peasant jacquerie against the landlords. So how the hell are people going to theorise that 
And how, part of how they attempt to theorise that is to go back to uh, the 1850 address. That's where this stuff, Trotsky and Parvis and Ryazanov, uh, comes from. <coughs> now, in this context, there is a sharp difference between Trotsky, on the one hand, Luxembourg, Trotsky, Lenin. Mm -hmm. Luxembourg takes essentially the line, this is a work of revolution. Any government which comes out of it will be a work of government. It is a model we can, in the mass tri political party and the trade unions, Luxembourg offers the Russian Revolution as a model uh, for the German movement. The peasantry, well, they're inert. They're not doing anything. They're inactive. They're insignificant. Trotsky um, says the peasantry can't function as a political factor because they're so diverse, disorganized, etc. They can't form a, a, a distinct political... They're incapable of forming a distinct political party. After 1905, Trotsky does admit that the peasantry can form political parties because they, in fact, did so in 1905. But in his writings during 1905, he's saying the peasantry can't form a political party. The peasantry are bound to split between the possessing classes and the working class. Therefore, the line of the working class has to be for the working class to take power in alliance with the semi-proletarianized poor peasants, the landless peasants, the landless people in the countryside. Therefore, in Results and Prospects, this is all changed in what Trotsky writes in the 1920s, but in Results and Prospects, what Trotsky says is, we should not be project-mongering in relation to demands for the distribution of land to the peasantry. We should be building up the forces of the poor peasantry on the basis of alliance with the proletariat, on the basis of demands like the nationalisation of the big estates and uh, uh, an agricultural line like the agricultural line of Engels uh, for uh, France and Germany. Lenin says something different. He says, actually, the peasantry are uh, the biggest class in Russian society, overwhelmingly dominant. The peasantry are the class out of which the army is recruited. The regime is not going to fall without a movement of the peasantry. And there will be no movement of the peasantry unless the social democrats say we will distribute the land to the peasantry. We, unless we make, raise the demand, mm -hmm. not just as it had been in the 1903 program, we demand that the cut off lands, the lands which the landlords had taken off the peasantry in consideration of emancipating them, of them ceasing to be unfree, unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, not just we demand the return of the cut off lands, but we demand the expropriation of the landlords' lands altogether and their distribution among the peasantry. It's commonly said that Lenin adopted the social, social revo socialist revolutionaries agrarian program in 1917. It's not true. He adopted it in 1905. His uh, polemics of that period uh, have that character. Now, Lenin says, if we do this, <coughs> if we do this, the peasantry, because they will be so grateful to the workers' movement for the working class taking the lead in taking the lands off the landlords and uh, distributing it to the peasantry. The peasantry will support a democratic government. The peasantry as a whole, as a class, will be a reliable support for a democratic government. It doesn't, we think, as a matter of practice, that the revolution will spread into Western Europe and uh, that as the revolution spreads across the world, we will be able to take steps towards socialism. But it's not indispensable to the survival of the government that the revolution should spread into Western Europe and we should be able to take steps towards socialism. And the it's not indispensable because the peasantry has this fundamental interest in acquiring the land. When they've got the land, they will support a democratic government, the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. Now, Trotsky, in 1905, 
is, isn't substantially addressing that question. But in the aftermath of 1905, in debates in the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party, Trotsky says that's false. And the reason why it's false is because the peasantry are petty proprietors. What's the first thing that the work government is going to have to do in the interests of the working class? The eight-hour day. Will the peasantry support the eight-hour day? Absolutely not. The peasantry, when confronted with legislation to impose the eight-hour day, will uh, ally the, certainly the larger peasantry who employ labour. The eight-hour day is a bloody disaster for them. Uh, they will ally with the bourgeoisie to oppose the eight-hour day. And so a, work, a stable worker peasant government is impossible because the interests of the working class and the peasantry in relation to the regulation of labour, minimum wages, maximum hours, are antagonistic. Therefore, says Trotsky, as soon as we have seized power, the peasantry as, as a class will rise up against us. We will have to rest on the poor peasantry, the unity of interests of the landless peasantry with the proletariat, and the agricultural labourers, and to begin a process of class struggle within the countryside. But even so, look at Russia. The proletariat is a small minority. There is no way, says Trotsky, that a proletarian government can survive in Russia for more than a period of weeks or months without the revolution spreading to the West. But he says, we can be confident that the revolution will spread to the West. First off, the revolution, the Russian revolution, will let loose the revolution in Poland. So it will have an ally in Poland, <coughs> and we'll be on the borders of Germany with a workers' government standing on the borders of Germany and uh, uh, by domino effect triggering uh, the revolution in Central Europe and Germany. Second off, we make the revolution in Russia. Britain and France got really big investments in Russia. It's going to crash the London and Paris stock exchanges. And by crashing the London and Paris stock exchanges, it will trigger the revolution <coughs> in, uh, uh, in Britain and France. Actually, these arguments uh, are unsound. First off, on the triggering the revolution in Central Europe, it just forgot about the fact that uh, the Russian state was uh, the uh, sworn enemy of the East European peoples and that the Poles, uh, if they got their independence, would immediately become enemies of the Russian state, as in fact happened. You know, they <coughs> um, second off, equally, just to say, we're going to crash, we'll crash the London and Paris stock exchanges and that will trigger the revolution. Excuse me, the London and Paris stock exchanges had crashed at least 20 times in the 19th century, not always leading to a, 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 an economic crisis, and certainly not always leading to uh, an outbreak of revolution. Okay, so the consequence therefore... <coughs> There is a strategic difference on this question between Lenin and Trotsky. Unfortunately, both of them are wrong. Lenin is wrong because Trotsky is right on the question of the antagonism between the interests of the peasantry and the proletariat. And that appeared in 1917. The, the, the revolutionary government in October decreed land to the peasantry, legalising the existing land seizures by the peasantry, and uh, what happens? The cities starve. The peasants are not prepared to supply. They, their, their internal antagonisms of, peasant, of petty family production and their in particular interests in commons have the effect that the peasantry are not willing to supply land, grain, to feed the cities. So what then happens in uh, December 1918 is that the Russian government, December 1917-18 is that the uh, Soviet government creates the Cheka, it creates a striking force, military striking force out of the urban workers and sends them into the countryside to expropriate grain 
from the peasantry. And we have immediately an antagonism between the uh, proletariat and the peasantry. And Lenin, at this period in 1917-18, uh, actually Lenin comes closest to accepting Trotsky was right and he was wrong. He says, down to October we marched with the peasantry as a whole. On the aftermath of October, uh, we, uh, um, we uh, were forced to march, uh, we were forced to enter into class struggle in the countryside. Class struggle in the countryside, it seems to me, is a bit of a euphemism uh, for sending out armed grain seizure forces of armed workers to go out and seize grain in the countryside. But uh, <coughs> uh, uh, that uh, we can leave on one side. Um, Trotsky's wrong for a different reason. The reason why Trotsky's wrong is not that the Russian Revolution doesn't trigger uh, Europe-wide revolution, in a sense, is that if you look at where the Russian Revolution triggers revolutionary movements, it's not in Central Europe, which is of strategic importance to the survival of the regime. It's in Germany, in Italy, in Austria, uh, to a lesser extent in France, and even in Britain, where there's mass uh, mutinies again of one sort and another, and. Uh, uh, very extensive class struggle. In the United States, in other words, the Russian Revolution triggers revolution not in the immediate borderlands of the Tsarist regime, which would then enable it to be in immediate contact with Germany. It triggers revolution in the countries which have the most advanced and developed working class movement, in the most capitalist countries. And for those countries, uh, the formula of permanent revolution is useless. So they, 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 there is discussion in the Second International of what the revolution in an advanced capitalist imperialist country would look like. But to be honest, it's incredibly limited and it's reasonably clear that the people involved just haven't thought about what does it mean to overthrow the state, thought seriously about what it means to overthrow the state in their country. And uh, of course, the labor bureaucracy, the trade union bureaucracy, has become a partner with the state in imperialism, in uh, Germany, in France, in England, um, and uh, even in the United States, actually, trade unions have begun to be integrated in production boards in the war, war period. Mm. And in those circumstances, the expectation that the backward country would be upheld by the spread of the revolution. Turns out to be a mistaken expectation. And the Russian leadership tries to force the situation by various methods which we've got the relics of in the history of the Communist International and uh, which leave their imprint on the organized far left of one sort or another, eventually fails, and eventually we wind up with, if the proletariat were to come to power, the measures which it would introduce would be petty bourgeois and not directly proletarian. The measures which the Russian regime introduces are indeed petty bourgeois and not directly proletarian. Okay, I've gone on longer than I intended to. I think I'll leave it at that with simply the point. The historical issue, <coughs> it's not the case, it's very important that it's not the case pro the permanent revolution is wrong, therefore uh, the Menshevik the the theory of revolution by stages uh, and uh, the alliance with the Kuomintang, etc. is right. That's wrong. That's rubbish. That's just another form of uh, 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 utopian socialism. It is the case, however, that the permanent revolution is not a, as the circumstances stood, the permanent revolution is not a workable strategy. And the reason why it isn't a workable strategy at the end of the day is that uh, the proletariat, in order to seize power, is going to have to act internationally. 
it's going to have to act internationally under capitalism. It's not a matter of first the proletariat in each country has to settle accounts with its own bourgeoisie, which is what uh, uh, Marx and Engels say in the Communist Manifesto. It's not a matter of thinking about uh, the relationship of forces in every individual country. It is a matter of thinking about the common action of the proletariat on an international scale, which then creates the conditions in which it might be the case that a revolutionary outbreak in a single country can be generalized within months at continental level. That's it. Okay, I said, right, okay, in relation, to, I, I, spoke, I spoke before in response to Nick about the question of is it possible, is it the right judgment, in a sense that's the same issue with Marche's point. Uh, the, 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 my point as I understand it is this, in terms of judgment of revolutionary possibilities, yeah, um, we do have to, we, we, we have to say it, the, it's morally impossible to see any other choice open to them. Yeah. I, I, I don't think, you know, I think it, even if you know in advance that the German social democracy will betray, what the hell are they supposed to do in a situation where the choice which they've actually got is between uh, uh, themselves and Kornilov? which is actually what it is. It's, well, not Kornilov as an individual. It's, in, it's them or the white generals. That's it. There are no other options. The Mensheviks or the social revolutionaries will just put the white generals into power. So that what you've got, if the option, if you don't do what the Bolsheviks did, is not 1918 and then 10 years down the line, no, 15 years down the line, 1933. It's 1918 and then two months down the line, 1933. Yeah. Not again. Hmm? It's not a gamble. Well, it's a gamble in the sort of it's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a gamble because you, you can still lose. Yeah, you, in the sense it's a sort of you're, you're, in a situa you're in a situation heads you win, heads you lose, tails you lose, almost. There's, there's a, but there's that tiny chance that you might win. Yeah, and even if the chance is tiny in that circumstance, it's you you, you have to take it. It's a sort of almost a sort of better to die on your feet than. Die, die on your feet. The choice is not die on your feet or live on your knees, but die on your feet or die on your knees. It's the, it's the choice which is, which is, is on offer. You know? um, and we only don't see that. We don't see that because the, because the Bolsheviks won. Whereas we do see, in Finland, we see uh, 15 to 20% of the working class was killed you know, where the whites won. Of not, not, of the, not of the trade union movement, of the working class, 15 to 20% was killed. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, the flip side of it, suppose that we're making these judgments now about what to do. Yeah, we have to assume, first off, we have to assume that uh, the uh, uh, international, that imperialism will intervene. It's not an answer to say it's morally correct now to pursue revolutionary path because uh, the defeat took place in 1918 to 21 because imperialism intervened to support uh, the Polish Socialist Party in Poland because it's the Polish Socialist Party which organised the anti-Russian nationalism. It was the Polish Socialist Party, in fact, was already clearly anti-Russian nationalist. There's a nice text in here. Um, from uh, PSP critique of, uh, uh, of Kautsky, yeah. uh, arguing precisely that the Russians will never make a revolution, it's the Poles who have to be the leading people in Eastern Europe. Mm. So you have to assume that imperialism will intervene, that it will intervene in a coordinated way, that if there's a workers' government in Britain there will be successively uh, uh, financial sanctions within one day and a US naval blockade within six months, supported by the rest of Europe. You, know, you have to assume that. That's your assumption, starting point. Our strategy has to be based on the assumption that we fight an enemy which is a coordinated enemy which will act internationally in a coordinated way to crush movements of the working, 
crush any attempt of the working class to take power, using financial sanctions, trade blockade, naval blockade, support for terrorism, military action, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, that's assumption. Mm -hmm. Second assumption, we have to assume that there is a uh, there are antagonisms of interest between the proletariat and the petty proprietors. Mm -hmm. So that it's illusory to suppose we can hold up in one country on the basis of worker-peasant alliance, because what you'll actually get is a peasant-based regime. Mm -hmm. And that is, in reality, peasant-based regime is what the Stalinist regime was, is what the Maoist regime was, is what uh, all the various sub-Stalinist sub regimes the peasantry was the social basis of absolutism. And what is constructed is a substitute absolutism. Hence, conclusion, not do nothing. Conclusion, the proletariat needs to organize for international action now under capitalism and not just occasional fests like uh, World Social Forum, talk fests, World Social Forum style, or even talk fests a la uh, the Congresses of the Second International, mm -hmm. but common action at the level of uh, common action to stand in Euro elections, uh, looking for uh, Europe-wide or Latin America-wide strike action or North America-wide strike action or uh, Arab East-wide strike action of all transport workers will, will take action, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. We have to look at that, that's even, okay, maybe the case that we'll be thrown into a situation where there's a revolutionary crisis and we haven't got that far, and then we're back in the situation that the Bolsheviks were in, and we have to gamble that we can take that some tiny, tiny chink of light will, will let us win. Yeah. But basically we have to organise for working class common action on international scale under capitalism. Uh, so that's the, the possibility stuff. Um, on the agrarian question, actually I think Yasmin and Nick are right. That it, it doesn't so saying that doesn't solve the problem of what you say about the agrarian question. We do have to, in reality actually, we have to say things about the agrarian question here, not just you, know, you might think, God in heaven, Britain has had capitalist agriculture for at least 400 years. Why the hell have we got things to say about the agrarian question here? But the answer is that there's a sort of real paradox, which is that in spite of the fact, well, the, the, the level of the organic composition of capital in agriculture is now so high that it's actually family worked. Yeah. These people are capitalists. Yeah, but the capitalist, the, 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 the level of mechanisation is so high that uh, you can uh, work uh, a farm mainly with family labour with small amounts of casual labour coming in. Yeah. Yeah, family uh, concern, they're totally subordinate to the grocery uh, five Oh, absolutely. They, 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 but they have no independence, but it's nonetheless the case that because they have the illusion of independence, yeah. And the yeah. subsidy from the EU as well. And the subsidy from the EU. Yeah, because they have the illusion of independence, that has political consequences which we have to address. And that's actually also true of the nomads that Yasmin was talking about. Uh, in reality, part nomadic pastoralism is dependent on the existence of a settled agriculture or alternatively of a capitalist regime for it to exchange with. It isn't actually the case that nomadic pastoralists can be self-sufficient in the tools which they need in order to carry on nomadic pastoralism. And equally, they agree they need land rights agreement and transit rights agreement for transhumans. Yeah. Um, but the illusion exists that you can live outside. Uh, and that illusion requires us to have um, some sort of policy. My personal view is that actually the best building blocks for policy, for policy are actually going to be those of Engels, the peasant question in France and Germany, in spite of the fact that the, act, that the, the concrete social forms and the concrete social relations are extremely different. Yeah? Um, not the, you know simply that the, the underlying ground is has to be along the lines of we want to incorporate you into generalized collective production 
we recognise that you don't want to be incorporated into generalised collective production. Yeah. There are things which we can do to help you out, but they're limited and they certainly don't involve, and in particular actually on the, the question of uh, the rights of women and youth, that is the crunch question, and it seems to me likely to be the crunch question just as much in relation to uh, uh, pastoralists as it is in relation to um, settled cultivators. I may be wrong on that, but it, it, you know, obviously, and again, everything is concrete. The, the world does not consist of, we have a schema which is global and uh, everything fits like a uh, parts of a machine into it. It, it, it has levels of diversity um, which mean, for example, actually, just a, an example, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks did not split in Siberia until October 1917. They formed common organisations until October 1917. The level of diversity within a single country yeah, can mean that there are very different tasks. It's probably the case that there are very different tasks in Exeter from those in London. Okay? England is a small and unusually homogenous country. Yeah. But, so in that sense, what we're talking about here in a sense is issues of strategic framework. Yeah. Um, on the democratic revolution, tasks of the democratic revolution, uh, James, I think, made uh, the fundamental point. It is a complete illusion to suppose that the bourgeoisie, that the democratic revolution is a task of bourgeoisie. And that's why, it's because of the idea that the democratic revolution is a task of the bourgeoisie, and that the bourgeoisie has a common interest with the proletariat in democracy. That's why so many Trotskyists have become people's frontists and believers in stages theory through saying, well, the permanent revolution says the first step is to make the democratic revolution, and we do this alongside the African National Congress, or alongside uh, the MDC, or for that matter, actually, that many years ago, it would have been alongside Mugabe. Yeah. And then at some point in the future, uh, the objective dynamics will objectively drive towards the socialist revolution. Yeah drive the proletariat, and you may come at Grant and Co, Grant and Taff, and Mandel, and um, the American SWP, and so on and so forth. All of those people, they explain it as an objective process. There's an objective tendency for the democratic revolution to turn into the proletarian revolution. The misunderstanding, the underlying misunderstanding, is the bourgeoisie doesn't in the least have an interest in democratic revolution. The bourgeoisie has an interest in overthrowing the institutions of feudalism and creating institutions which are answerable to capital, principally stock markets, central banks and independent courts. Mm -hmm. Okay, democracy was the uh, ideological banner which they raised in 1789. Mm -hmm. waved in 1789. In the 1600s, the ideological banner which they waved was Protestantism. Mm -hmm. Still, the outcome is the same. Central bank, stock market, independent judiciary, mm -hmm. corruption, some sort of corruptly elected or co-opted equally. Actually, the uh, regions of uh, the Netherlands were co-opted. Uh, the uh, House of Lords of England, which was, to a considerable extent, the actual governing chamber, was co-opted or institution, mm -hmm. not an elected institution. The bourgeoisie doesn't have an interest in elections. It has an interest in the representation of capital in proportion to the amount of capital it has, mm -hmm. which may be done through agency relations, me mass media, advertising, as it is now, but preferably would be done simply directly through a property graded franchise and the co optation of big capitalists into a House of Lords type body. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the, 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 the concept of tasks of the democratic revolution is confusing. At the same time, there is a task of the bourgeois revolution, and this is why I focused on the agrarian question, because the agrarian question clearly is a task of the bourgeois revolution. Mm -hmm. 
It is a task of capitalism to displace, replace feudalism, including replacing feudalism in agriculture. And it is the case in relation to imperialism that imperialism carries with it that capitalism, capitalist development at the centre may uh, strengthen and intensify feudalism or slavery in the periphery. That certainly happened in relation to Russia and Poland in the 16th and 17th century, that Dutch and British demand for wheat intensified serfdom in Russia and Poland. It was reintroduced in Poland. Reintroduced in Poland, yeah. Uh, and, uh, in uh, Prussia as well, East, East Prussia. Mm -hmm. So the, in that sense, I, the idea that, I, the, again, the idea that imperialism is new in the 1880s is nonsense. Every capitalist state is an imperialist state, it would, or would like to be an imperialist state. The Venetians in the late, 50, in the 50, late 14th through the 15th century uh, engaged in uh, colonisation of Cyprus and Crete, exporting capital to construct sugar plantations and sugar mills and buying in slaves to operate these sugar plantations and sugar mills. Mm -hmm. The Dutch, the first thing the Dutch Revolution does is create an East India Company, a territorial empire. Mm -hmm. First thing the English Revolution does is to start uh, uh, invading Jamaica, etc., fighting global wars, etc., etc., etc. So, um, <clears throat> in relation to, uh, yes, imperial imperialism is an endemic feature of capitalism. There is, let's put it this way, there is, capitalism is in decline. Capitalism has been in decline since the late 19th century and we can see it by the fact that capitalism makes at the core concessions to the working class in order to keep, keep, keep control. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> that's not the same thing as there is a sharp new epoch uh, imperialist epoch which opens in 1880. So the concept of the democratic revolution is hopeless and it leads back in the direction of class collaborationism and the, 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 the stuff about uh, Ahmadinejad is an anti-imperialist <coughs> for carrying out the tasks of the national democratic revolution is demonstration of exactly what it practically means, which of course was what was practically meant by the stages theory. The stages theory in the 1920s was a theory about why communists should support the Kuomintang or why it was appropriate for the Russian government to uh, not make any big fuss about uh, Kamal Ataturk shooting communist leaders. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, da, 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 possibilities, agrarian question, democratic revolution, imperialism, objective, um, permanent revolution. Okay, I left with a couple of other things, which was just small points. Lars on Lenin in 1918. Yeah, I, th I think the point about this quotation is that, okay, Lenin says it happened just as we said, but in reality, if you look back at two tactics, yeah. He isn't saying we're going to seize power with the backing of the peasantry as a whole and then within three months we'll be fighting them. That's what Trotsky says. Yeah. Um, conversely, Trotsky on, 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 on Trotsky, again, I, I find it in the sense of in um, both in 1905 and in uh, Results and Prospects, he's saying we shouldn't be playing around with this uh, split up the land stuff. I, 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 I will talk about that. But I'm sure... I'm saying exactly that, so I have a little... Okay, there. right, we will... Uh, <laughs> you will, you will I, I will be happy to be disproved okay. on this. It's um, uh, <coughs> not material. Back to um, the central issue is... I'm, in a sense, the historical question is, is for me secondary. I'm interested in history. I teach history. That's not my sort of history. But uh, um, I, for me and for, the, for this meeting, the historical question is secondary. And the, the, the question equally, the historical question of the moral responsibility of the should they have gambled or shouldn't they, uh, was it like putting money on 100 to 1 outsider or a 5 to 1 favourite, is secondary. 
Yeah? The question is actually what lessons should we draw from this stuff for now? Mm -hmm. And the lesson, which I, I, the lesson which I draw from this stuff for now actually is I don't think that results and prospects leads to class collaborationism. You know, the, the Trotsky of results and prospects leads to class collaborationism. But I do think that the Trotsky of uh, the 14 theses at the end of the book The Permanent Revolution in 1920 does lead to class collaborationism. <coughs> Precisely because of its insistence on this thing of the democratic, uh, the democratic tasks and marching with the peasantry as a whole. Because the problem is, it's not true that the peasantry, it's, it's true that the peasantry is forced to decide between the fundamental classes. But it's not true that because the peasantry is forced to decide between the fundamental classes, it cannot find political representation or act in support of autonomous peasant goals. That is to say, patriarchalism, the setting up of a... Uh, uh, an absolute ruler, a cult of personality, whether it's of Lenin or of Saddam Hussein or of uh, Robert Mugabe. Yeah. Uh, the, the peasantry can act for independent goals. Trots, and moreover, the other side of it, the bourgeoisie is not represented by, uh, is not usually represented, let's put it this way, by individual capital, some individual capitalist, like Silvio Berlusconi is an odd oddity. Yeah. We do not usually find prime ministers who are major individual or presidents who are major individual capitalists. The bourgeoisie is represented by parties of the petty bourgeoisie. And the problem with the worker-peasant alliance is that it slides with extraordinary ease, especially if you talk about the national and democratic tasks of the bourgeois revolution, starting with the national and democratic tasks of the bourgeois revolution, it slides with extraordinary ease back into the policy of supporting the Kuomintang and it, the equivalence of supporting the Kuomintang. And it does so, in fact, precisely because of the purpose of the document, the permanent revolution written in the Trotsky's The Permanent Revolution written in the 1920s is defensive against Stalinism. Mm -hmm. But in order to make that defense against Stalinism, he's making major concessions to the majority who wanted to say, yes, we should support the Kuomintang. Mm -hmm. And those concessions are contained within the rewriting of the theory from results and prospects, which says one thing, to the Permanent Revolution, which says something different. So, is permanent revolution essential to, is it appropriate to set up an organisation called permanent revolution? I don't know if we've got any permanent revolution comrades here, I don't <laughs> think so. Uh, is, is, is acceptance of permanent revolution an essential to uh, revolutionary politics in today's world? Well, in the sense in which Jerry put it, that you reject socialism in one country, that you insist on the international quality of the revolution, that you insist that the working class needs to aim for power in the hands of the working class, yes, those are all essentials. But that isn't the theory of permanent revolution ties you to a whole lot more than that, and that what it ties you actually brings you back into the class collaborationist perspective. That's uh, the purpose of uh, what I was talking about today.